just need to finish off this set of slides here. And uh, that's it for me, really, in terms of this module. As I mentioned before, uh, Dr. Frank Leonard will be, Dr. Frank Walsh, sorry, will be taking over uh, from, well, not next week, because next week is a kind of a tools down week from uh, week eight onwards. So let's pick up the story on these slides here. Uh, so there is this other hook uh, that I wanted to mention called the use reducer hook. Now there is code that comes with this set of slides and the code is really related to kind of a demo of this, uh, this hook. And I was just going to maybe show you the demo first because it might make explaining the hook just a little bit easier. So if you just grab uh, this archive and do the usual stuff with it. And so I've imported this into VS Code. Uh, can I again now check that people are hearing me okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'll just start up my app. This was conceived back in April, May, when everybody was holding Zoom parties. So this is where the idea comes from. I don't think I'm gonna make a lot of money out of it though. So here's the idea. Um, I have a list of uh, people, friends that I've invited to a party. Okay, I'm actually getting these from the random user API, which we've used before. And uh, as people uh, respond back and confirm that they're attending my party, I just click on them and they get added to the list on the right. Okay. And if subsequently somebody says, uh, comes back and says they can't actually make the party, having already told me they could, then I, if I click on them on this side, they get put back into the list on the left. Okay. So, uh, that's what it does. And I guess the whole idea of the app is it needs to keep track of who has, who is not attending or who has not confirmed uh, versus those who have confirmed that they're attending. Okay. That keeps changing. So that's the idea of the app. Now, the use reducer hook is really just actually an alternative to the use state hook. So it's also about managing a state within a component. And when would you use use reducer as opposed to use state? Well, what I'm saying there is if the if the makeup of your state is something non-trivial, like up to now, I think our state variables have been maybe a string or a Boolean, um, all fairly straightforward. Okay, we had one which was an array, but we, we never actually did anything to the array in terms of changing its state. But if, uh, if your state is, uh, in terms of its data structure is non-trivial, or more importantly, if the way the state changes is non-trivial, then you might consider using use reducer instead. I'm talking there about mutating the state. If the way a state is meant to mutate or change, if that actual change has to be computed in some way, then it might be a better idea to use the use reducer rather than use state. Okay. And I also told you at the very beginning when I was talking about React that React only concerned itself with the V part of MVC. And back then, like the M part is still very important, like how you manage the model data associated with your React app. That's still like, it's not straightforward and 
uh, okay, you could write all the boilerplate code yourself to manage the model data that is going to live inside the browser. But frameworks emerged over time, and one of the most common and popular frameworks in this whole area is the Redux framework. So if you Google anything about React, you'll often come across references to blogs that use Redux with React. And Redux is all about um, is all about uh, in, uh, supporting your implementation around the M part of MVC for a web-based app. Now, in recent years, kind of the React framework has dipped its toes in that whole M part of MVC, and Use Reducer is really part of the kind of React solution to uh, how you might manage the M part of your MVC. Um, React app. In fact, the the contexts that I was talking about there the last day, they're also part of React's um, approach towards managing model data associated with a React app. So that's um, just by the way, by, by, my, by way of background, I suppose. Now, this user reducer hook, uh, this is how you invoke it. So it's quite similar to you state, not surprisingly, because it kind of targets the same area. But uh, when you invoke the user reducer hook, you've got to give it the initial value for your state um, object. It's usually an object. Uh, it's not a primitive really, because if it was a primitive, then we'd probably just use you use the use state hook. Uh, but anyway, how you um, you express here how you want to initialize the state variable. What this is, is a function that you have to implement and the implementation uh, contains the logic associated with how your state variable mutates or changes based on user interaction. Now in the context of our Zoom party app, for example, um, uh, the state in, that, in, in the case of that app, the state is my list of friends and who has confirmed they're attending and who is not attending. Right, And when I clicked on a user on the left, then clearly I had to change that particular user's um, state, if you like, in terms of whether they were attending or not, within the array of users, within the array of friends. Okay. Also, if I clicked on the user on the list on the right, then I had to change my state as well, because that user's uh, attendance now had changed to being a non-attender. Right. So the reducer is a function that you implement, and it contains the logic associated with how your state mutates. It has to implement that logic. Uh, what the use reducer hook returns is kind of similar to the use state. It returns the current value of the state. So that's the current status of my array of friends and who's attending and who's not attending. This batch is a function provided by the hook and you use the dispatch function to trigger a state change. So this is a bit like the setter method that you got back from new state, except it's a slightly more, uh, maybe much more, maybe um, elaborate implementation than the setter method. Note now, this is a function that you are provided with. So all you will ever have in your code is you will be invoking that function. Whereas you have to implement this in its entirety because it's only you know how your state mutates um, over time. So in terms of this, uh, this use reducer hook, there are a couple of kind of moving parts to it. There is this reducer function, which I've mentioned, which you implement. Now, you have to follow some um, guidelines, though, as to how you, well, you have to implement it with a certain signature, number one. And that's what I'm saying here. So the signature of the function, it has to be such that it takes two arguments, where the first argument is the current value of the state object. And the second argument is what we call is what is called an action. Um, in the case of my Zoom party app, the actions would be, uh, I have clicked on a user that should move from the array on the left to the array on the right. 
or I've clicked a user that should move the other way uh, from attending to non-attending. A third action would be when I actually loaded up the app initially and I, uh, I initialized my array to my full list of friends. Okay, so the action is meant to tell the reducer function which particular state change it should carry out. Also, the action will indicate the data associated with that state change, which I think I mentioned in a second. That's what you have to, that's what the use reduce, uh, sorry, that's what the reducer function receives, the current state and the action uh, that it should carry out. What it returns is the updated state. In other words, what's the, as a result of carrying out the action, what is the new value of the state? That's what it returns. Critically here, right? What you do not do inside in the reducer function, and again, this is stipulated by the use reducer hook, and if you don't follow it, then it's just not going to work properly. Um, what you should not do inside in this function is take this state variable and make a change to it. In other words, do not carry out the action on the current state object. What you need to do is you need to make a copy of that state object and carry out the action on the copy and then return the copy as being the new state value. That's really important. That's what I'm saying here. Now, in terms of the second argument, an action, there are rules as well as to how you structure that. So the action should be an object structure and it should have two parts to it. The first part is uh, indicating to the reducer function what type the action is. In the case of my Zoom party app, there were three types of actions. Load the full list of friends, move a friend from uh, uh, being a non-attender to an attender or in the other direction. So there was three action types. The payload associated with the action is, you know, the data associated with the action. So in the case of an action where I want to move a particular friend from being a non-attender to a confirmed attender to my party, then the payload would be the particular friend object or maybe their ID or something like that. So that's the action. Um, and that's kind of what I'm saying there. The final part then is the dispatcher or the dispatch function. Remember now the dispatch function is provided to you by the hook itself. That's, that's one of the things it returns. Um, it returns the dispatcher function. And you use the dispatcher function essentially to trigger a state change. And in the dispatcher function, what you do is you essentially just pass the action object, this guy up here, you pass the action object uh, that describes the state change that you want to have carried out on your state object, on your state variable. So the action might be, as I said, you know, move my friend from non-attender to attender, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in, obviously what happens inside the implementation of the dispatcher, you don't implement this now, it's provided for you, but what the dispatcher function does is it calls your reducer function. You never call your reducer function directly. Okay, It only ever is invoked via the dispatcher. Now let's look at maybe some of the detail in the code. So, sorry, no. If I look at some of the components first, maybe kind of from the bottom up. So I have a, I have a friend, friend component. Uh, and that just displays a friend's name, um, nothing else. But it is, it kind of has a, essentially it's a, it's a button really like, well, that's the way I implemented it anyway. You know, I implemented these as buttons where the text of the button is just the friend's name. 
but the button is clickable. So that's all that's all a friend component does, right? Uh, the action associated with clicking the button is actually passed in as a prop. Is that right? Uh, well, not in, 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 not indirectly. Sorry. Uh, the 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 on click handler sort associated with the button is here, as you can see. And really, all the on click handler does is it calls a function that was passed into it as a prop. So we'll see this function in a second. And so the the uh, the function will depend on whether the friend is on the list on the left or the right at any particular point in time. I have a friends list com uh, component, and you can only predict what it does. It just iterates over the list of friends that it has received from its parent, which we have yet to look at, maps over them to produce an array of friend components. Okay. The main component though, or the main file is this one here. So I feel like this is the one at the top of my hierarchy. And here's my implementation of my reducer function, which I'll just skip over for a second, if that's okay. And here's the main component. By the way, it's, it's not mandatory, but it's conventional to have your reducer function implementation outside of the actual component. You, you could move it inside the component, but uh, and it won't make any difference in terms of the runtime behavior. It would actually affect the performance side of your app, right? Even though we're not concerned about performance. But so here's the component at the top of my hierarchy. It's the one that's actually using the user reducer hook. Now, in my case, the state object that's being managed by the hook is this one. So it's an object which is one key value pair and uh, it's no guesses as to what the, the the key value pair is about. So this is going to have my full list of friends. And initially it's empty. I have a, a use effect code to make the API call. And notice when the API call returns back, what I actually do is I use my dispatcher function because that's what's going to trigger a state change. Now, when I was talking about the actions there, what the actions are for a particular app completely depends on the nature of the app, obviously enough, I suppose. So what, what, what different action types you have, you've got to come up with those. Um, and I've already given you an indication that there are three types of actions in my Zoom party app. One of the actions, I've just decided to give it that as its name, load my invitees or load my friends. Here's the payload associated with the action. And it's the array of friends that were returned back by, uh, by the API. So might be appropriate now to actually look at the reducer. So we know when this line of code executes, what actually happens behind the scenes is within the dispatcher function itself, it calls our reducer, passing it this action. This is the this is an entire action now. It's an object. Okay. So back up to my reducer. Remember now the dispatcher calls this. So the dispatcher provides the action and it also gives it the, the current value of the state. And let's assume that the current value of my state is its initial value. It's an empty array of friends. And in 99% of cases, a reducer function uh, is implemented as a case switch statement where the switch is based on the action type, examining the action type. And the case, each case then is an implementation of the state mutation that should be carried out for each particular action. So let's look at the action that has just happened, which is this one. Sorry, not that one, beg your pardon. This one here. Okay. Again. I did a dispatch where the type was load invitees. So this is the 
this is the action that my reducer is going to carry out. And I said that the reducer function has to return the new value, if you like, for your state uh, variable. And that's really what I'm doing here. I'm constructing a new object. I also told you that you cannot, the reducer cannot change the state that it was passed in. Uh, it has to make a copy of it somehow uh, and change the copy. And that's effectively what I'm doing here because I'm creating a new object with that as a key and the value for this key I'm actually getting by uh, digging into the payload and the friends in the payload, I'm mapping over them. Now, the reason I'm mapping over them, I mean, I could have just, um, you might've thought I would just return or I would have assigned to friends action.payload.friends. But the reason I'm actually mapping over the array is because in each of the friend objects in my array, which I have received from the random user API, I want to attach a new property to each friend object where the property name is that and I've initialized it to false. So this is the property that I'm going to use to determine whether a friend um, has confirmed that they're attending the party or not. I've just decided to do it that way. Uh, in, the, in the map, here's my callback function for a map. You know how map works. And I am setting, sorry, what am I doing? Oh yeah, I'm just setting, adding a new property, as I said, assigning it to false and then returning that friend. Okay, so that's that. So now my state has my full list of friends and each of them has its confirmed property set to false. Fair enough, I guess. Um, I'll look at the other actions in a second. Moving on, uh, I've got a little two functions here and they both use or uh, invoke in the dispatch. So they're both carrying out state changes. These two functions are the functions I pass down to my friend components. In other words, when a friend is in a friend button is clicked, it's either this function is triggered or this function is triggered as a return, as, as a result, sorry. So these, okay, are straightforward enough. I suppose we could, we could look at it, right? So it looks like that this function will be invoked when I click a friend uh, that has confirmed that they will attend. So they're currently on the list on the left and I want to move them to the list on the right. Uh, and so the dispatch is going to initiate the state change. The type of action, I've just described it, call it that, add it to confirmed. The payload for the action is the particular friend object that was clicked by me. I'm passing in the full friend object. I could have passed in their ID or email, I think is their ID effectively, but I've decided to just pass in the entire friend. So whenever this dispatch uh, invocation is triggered, then my reducer function executes. And in the add to confirmed action, here's how I uh, implement that action. And again, I'm returning the new state object. And the way I'm computing the state object is I am going to the current state object. That's a reference to the current state object passed in here. I'm accessing the friends within that state object. I'm mapping over them. Now, it's really important that I do the map here because what we know what map is going to do, it's going to create a new array and that's what I want. I don't want to change the array of friends that's currently associated with the state object. I want to create a completely new array of friends. So map will do that for me. And then the detail of the callback that I passed to map Really all I'm doing here is I'm checking to see is the current friend that's being processed in the array, is their email address equal to the email address of the friend that was clicked? If it is, then set their confirm, confirmed uh, property to true. Um, and if not, then do nothing. 
we so if they're confirmed properly we remain as false and I return the friend so without laboring the point the map is really important here because it is creating a completely new copy of if you like it's creating a new copy of the friends array and the only difference between the current copy and the new copy is one particular friend has had their confirmed property changed over to uh, to true it would have been false and i may as well you know finish it here right so the explanation he, here's the other action when a friend has told me that they well they told me they were going to attend and then they uh, told me that they weren't so i'm essentially doing the opposite here of what i'm doing up here right i'm finding the particular friend and i'm setting their property to false it's only purely coincidental now that you know this action is very similar to the one above that that doesn't always arise with these actions but happens to be in this case um what else um here i'm actually i've decided i actually compute my full list of uh, confirmed attendees and my list of non-confirmed. I just iterate over the state looking for particular uh, friends with their confirmed property or true or false. So I, I do compute those and I pass these two arrays down to two invocations of friends list. You see I have a friends list invocation here and I have a friends list invocation here. In this friends list invocation, it looks like I'm passing down the computed list of confirmed attendees. And the action that I'm passing down is the action that would be associated with uh, removing a person from the list of attendees. This action here, uh, this property, sorry, it's not used by friends list. It's actually used by the friend component. And if I look at the friend component, so I'm passing in a prop called action and a particular function reference. And if I look at the friend list component, I'm actually using the action prop to pass down to my friend component. So that when I click on that friend, then it triggers the appropriate uh, state change above in the top level component. Again, a few moving parts there. Uh, I would certainly expect you to have to go back and study that. I do use the use reducer in the movies app. I brought it into part four. Uh, so it was kind of intentional really that I wanted to do that. Don't know if there are any questions. Uh, again, it would require you to study this. I would advise studying this first to make sure you understand how that works. Uh, and then it, it would be able to, you should be able to understand how it works in the context of the movies app, but I'm not sure if there's any initial questions. No, okay. So that's this whole user reducer hook. Now, this is the last thing I wanna talk about. Uh, and it seems like an anticlimax because essentially what I'm talking about here is a bit like uh, how do you implement log in, log out. Uh, it's a little bit more than that though, in that what would be nice is, or what, what often materializes in React apps is you want certain uh, routes to be private or protected. In other words, the user has to authenticate themselves before they are allowed into that particular part of the app. So how might we implement private routes or protected routes? And in order to do it, then we have to implement some form of authentication. So it's a very specific kind of problem. And, you know, we know, we know how these things work, right? So I'm actually this, the, the code now associated with this goes back to the whole routing samples that I gave you from a few weeks back, because it's kind of essentially a routing problem. You know, you want certain routes to be protected or private. 
and other ones not so. And you also want to implement authentication. So if you go back to the routing samples, uh, wherever they were, And it's actually sample nine. Now, there's not a whole lot of uh, exciting about how to uh, show, demonstrate authentication and log in and log out, but anyway. So this is Maria, my app, and my idea is that these two hyperlinks are can be accessed by anybody, but in order to access these two links, you're first forced to log in. And also what's kind of typical is my app is telling me that there's nobody currently logged in. I have the option of going straight to the login uh, page here. Alternatively, if I try and access one of the protected or private routes, these are my two protected and private routes, then automatically it redirects me to the login page. I didn't bother with the login form. Now we're not interested in that, but we would fill in our login details and click login. Now, when I click login here, uh, because I, I arrived at the login page as a result of clicking, was it the inbox I clicked? Then when I click login, I would like to be sent straight to the inbox. Um, rather than just being sent back to the home page and then having to click on the inbox again. Um, where well, it was my profile that I clicked, it seems rather than inbox, but you, you get the idea that somehow the app remembered where I wanted to go before it forced me to log in. Now that I'm logged in, up here I have the option, this, this part has changed because it knows I'm logged in. I have the option to log out. I can go anywhere I want to. I can go into the inbox now because I'm already logged in, even though it's a protected route. When I sign out, then I'm back to square one again. If I try to get at the inbox, I'm forced to log in, right? So that's the standard kind of behavior. And that's just explaining. So the overarching objective is to implement protected routes within our uh, routing configuration. Now, if you Google this, you get lots of solutions um, and some of them are good, some of them are clumsy. I found one that I thought was nice. I'll be honest, it's not a, uh, my implementation, it's one that I just found, uh, but I thought I liked the way that they approached it. So the first thing to say is that the React Router doesn't support the notion of protected routes. You've got to come up with your own custom implementation of it. You might have thought that they would uh, build it into the React Router library, but uh, they didn't for some reason, not sure why. And yes. I'm suggesting, and this is why I liked the solution that I found uh, online. Uh, we'd like our solution to be obviously easy to code, uh, relatively speaking anyway. Uh, declarative in nature, I think is the really important one because React itself has a declarative programming model. So our solution should be declarative in style as well. And, uh, oh yeah. And so ideally, this is what we would like to be able to do, right? So here's my routing configuration. And to actually, sorry, no, to have, you can see there in the, in the, in the um, codex up that I'm showing you, uh, with, within my set of routes, I have got ones that are clearly labeled as private routes. Okay, they have the same kind of interface as the routes that are provided by the React router. But that is very kind of declarative. It's very obvious what those 
uh, new routes are kind of saying that they are private. Uh, okay, so that's that's really what I liked about this uh, this solution that I found. But of course, we have to implement this private route component ourselves. And we want it to behave the way uh, we would expect it to behave. Now, the overall solution I'm saying here consists of a couple of parts. I am using React contexts again. Why? Because if you think about it, it's quite likely that a number of components within your uh, component hierarchy would need to know whether somebody is currently logged in or not. It may influence what the component renders. Uh, it may influence some of its behavior. And so when, when we've got that kind of uh, problem, we know from the last day that if you've got a number of components that needs to know about a particular state, because clearly somebody logged in or not is kind of a state um, variable, then the place to implement where you store that state will be in a context. That would be the logical place to put it. Um, number two there, I'm saying, we're obviously gonna be using prog programmatic navigation. Uh, we do it in a couple of places. Like when I clicked down the inbox, I was redirected programmatically to the login page. And equally, I think when I sign out, I'm kind of automatically sent back to the home page. And even when I click on the login button within the login form, I am programmatically sent to the original private page that I wanted to go to. So there's a lot of programmatic navigation uh, in the solution. And number three, um, this idea that the app somehow remembers where I was trying to, which route I was trying to go to before it forced me to the login page. How do I actually implement that kind of remember uh, feature? So again, all I'm gonna show you are the code excerpts and you can look at the detail yourself uh, in your own time because you have the, the full implementation. So this is, I suppose, the main one. This is the implementation of, uh, oh, sorry, no, this is the, the context. Sorry, I was going ahead of myself. So I, I've created a new context specifically to manage whether somebody is logged in or not. Uh, you, I'm not sure if any of you have made it into part four of the movies app, but turns out in, in relation to context that an app might have many contexts not just one. In the movies app, I have two contexts. I have one for managing my list of movies and I have another context for managing my list of genres. Well, if I wanted to add authentication to the movies app, then I, I would have a, I could have a third context specifically for um, storing whether somebody is logged in or not and potentially what their username is. You, you could put everything into one context, but that just wouldn't be good design from a separation of concerns point of view. So it's better to kind of to, to break them up if it, if it makes sense, which it does in this case. Now, what I've decided in this context here is, um, and it's just purely arbitrary, I've just decided that the state that's being managed there by my context provider component is just a Boolean, true or false, as to whether somebody is logged in or not. I suppose more, it would be more common that you might at least store the user's username in the context and maybe even some sort of um, key associated with the user, API key maybe or something like that. I've left that kind of detail out, but it wouldn't take a whole lot extra to extend my auth context provider there to uh, have that as part of its state as well. So the state in my case is simply a Boolean as to whether somebody is currently logged in or not. Okay, that's my state. Um, now, I, I, I didn't give the detail here, some of the detail because it's not really that important, but it's fairly obvious what this is a function uh, called authenticate. So this function obviously would be called when somebody fills in the login form and clicks the login button. Uh, okay, and so obviously this is going to make a state change. Uh, this is also obvious what this function might do. It's going to be called when the user clicks the sign out button, 
which would not also trigger a state change. Here's my uh, art context provider. We've seen all this before, okay? Uh, and in my art context, I'm storing the current state of my state variable. And I'm also passing down these two functions that I've defined here and making these available to other components that might need them. So this is my, this is the contents of my context. When I was talking about context the last day, I mentioned this in the, in terms of storing global data. This is essentially the global data in this case, but quite often as well, a context will store references to functions that uh, might be required by multiple other components. And that is the case here. These two functions uh, could potentially be required by a number of components. Let's assume that anyway. Here's the implementation of the private route. And what's going on here? So here's how you use the private route. And we saw that a couple of slides back. It's used exactly the same way as the route component that's provided by the React router. And that's kind of intentional. Uh, we want them to look very alike. So we have a path and we've got the component that we want to have mounted when the browser's URL is equal to that path, okay? Now, the implementation though, what the implementation has to do is determine, is there somebody logged in or not? If they're not logged in, then we want to redirect them to the login page. If they are logged in, then essentially replace this with an ordinary route. So that's how this private route component works. It makes, it checks to see, is there somebody logged in or not? And it either returns an ordinary route, and you can think of it as I'm replacing this, which appears in my routing configuration, I'm replacing it with an ordinary route. Alternatively, I am replacing it with a redirect. And the decision as to whether it's this or this, you can see what it's doing is, it's digging into the context that has been provided um, because I'm, I'm using my use context hook to get at the context. I'm examining the Boolean to see if that's true or false. And I either, return, as I said, this or this. What's going on up here is um, I'm taking, these are the props that are passed into my component and it looks like I'm taking the props and I'm performing uh, destructuring on them. I'm looking for the prop whose key is that which is obviously this one. I'm declaring a new variable with the same name, but capitalizing it. That's just a nice convenience. And all of the other props, which is certainly this one, but there might be other ones as well that are provided by the React router. All of the other props are put into a new variable called rest. So anyway, this is just the structuring going on here. And where I use this, I use this, as you can see here. I use this within the construction of my route that's being returned. I'm using rest here. So really what I want to do is I want to take all of these props and any other default props that are provided by the React router. And I want to stitch them into the route component that I'm going to return. The redirect. When we have used redirect up to now, we used it where the top prop was just assigned a string. Redirect is obviously a component that comes with the React router, and we know what it does. It changes the browser's URL to whatever the top uh, is assigned, which is normally a string, and then having changed the browser's URL, all the rest happens. It turns out that the top prop of redirect can also be assigned an object, and that's what I'm doing here. And why am I doing that? I'm doing that because one of my requirements is that I want to be able to somehow remember where was the user trying to go to when they were forced 
to log in. Now, if the browser's URL changes to slash inbox and the user is not logged in, then this is what we need to remember, that the path they were trying to get to was slash inbox. Where do you find that path? This is where you actually find it in props.location. Props.location will have, it's a full object actually, props.location. I'm showing you here what the object looks like. One of the keys in the object is path name and that path will be assigned the value of the path that the user was trying to go to, um, which is obviously like, I mean, it's here, right? So that, that's the browser's URL. When the user clicked on the inbox link in the demo that I gave you there, when the user clicked on the inbox link, the users, the, the browser's URL did change to that, but then this whole component kicked in and it forced, you know, the redirection but this is how I can actually hold on to where the user was trying to go to. And I'm actually holding on to it and I'm putting it into, um, I'm putting it into an extra prop. Uh, we've kind of seen this before when we talked about the link component and when we wanted to include additional props in a link component, that's essentially kind of what's going on here as well. So the net effect anyway of this piece of code is it does send the browser, it changes the browser's URL to that. Now, presumably there is a route in our routing configuration that indicates if the user, if the browser's URL is that, then it should mount the login page. So the next thing we need to look at is the detail of the login page. And within the login page implementation, we will be able to get at this here so that we will have access to the route that the user did want to go to before they were forced to log in. That's not straightforward, I know, but uh, here's the login page. Um, and just to finish this, well, maybe if we take it from the top, uh, again, we're using the context uh, we can skip over this for now. We can skip over this as well. Uh, okay, we're checking to see is the is there somebody logged in? But of course, if the login page is mounted, then clearly there isn't. So, on the initial mounting of this login page, of course, this statement is, is not going to be true. So it skips over that. Renders the login form with my button. User clicks on the button. That triggers my local function, which is here. I make, uh, I access my context. One of the things that's available in the context is a function, as you remember. Now I've just hard coded user one pass one, but these actual values presumably would be picked up from a web form that you might have down here. This function we saw earlier on, it triggers a state change within my alt context. And of course, if, this, if there's a state change in the alt context provider component, uh, this component is going to re-render. On the second re-rendering, this statement is now going to be true. So we come in here and lo and behold, it's redirecting the user this redirect now is going to send the browser back to the private page that the user tried to get at initially. And how am I specifying it? I'm specifying it by somehow accessing this variable up here. This variable up here is achieved by carrying out destructuring on props.location, that state, which I had on the previous slide. Okay, that's where it came from. You might be wondering, what's this all about? Well, uh, there are two cases where the login page might actually be loaded into the browser. One is when the user tried to access a private route and they were redirected to the login page. The other case is when the user actually just clicked the login button 
and went straight to the login page anyway. And if that, uh, in that particular case, it means we don't have a perhaps that location that stayed at all. You know, there was no private route that they were trying to get to and forced to log in. They just went straight to the login page. So what I'm doing here is I'm essentially kind of constructing a, an equivalent structure to Sorry, I'm constructing an equivalent structure to this. Um, that's what's going on here. Also quite tricky. Oh my God, sorry. Uh, you'll be glad to hear that's the last part of the implementation. Okay, there are the three main parts, the context, the private route implementation, which is quite tricky, and that, which is also only, really the only difficult part of that to grapple with, I think, is this part here. You have the full implementation in the samples that I have provided. So uh, you may want to go back and look at that in more detail. It is a full implementation. So once you kind of have a sense of how it works, it wouldn't be that difficult to lift the code that I've given you and actually use it in the Movies app so that you have authentication stitched into the Movies app, which doesn't have it at the moment. Now, how are we in time? I don't have a clock in front of me. Okay. The next thing I wanted to talk about, if I go to Moodle, is an assignment. I've put up a specification for the assignment. Uh, I can put it up on the website as well, but it's here anyway. Now, I'm not going to start talking into this now. There, there are two pages. This You can look at this detail yourself and I'll talk about it next week. But if you, uh, there's a second page here, which just talks about TMDB. Now, TMDB, as we know, is a web API and it has lots of what we refer to as endpoints. There is one endpoint is the discovery endpoint. That's the one that we use to get a list of movies. Uh, it has a movies endpoint and there are a number of parts to the movies endpoint. We've used this one where we get details about a particular movie. Uh, we've also used this one where we get the reviews. If you've walked your way through part three, we've used this part of the movies where we get a list of upcoming movies. But there are other parts that are kind of interesting as well. There's a credits part to the movies endpoint. And what that will give you is details on the cast and crew associated with the movie. Or you can get a list of similar movies to a particular movie. You can get the latest movies that have been released. You can get the movies that are now playing. You can get recommendations associated with the movie, um, et cetera. Popular, uh, popular movies um, and so on. So there's a lot of extra data there that's available to us. There's also a people's endpoint in TMDB. People in this context are really actors and uh, crew members. So if you use that endpoint, you can get details on a particular person, be it an actor or a producer or crew member, camera person, whatever. Um, you, can, you can get uh, details on all of the movies that particular person has been involved with or TV shows. We are not really, really covering the TV shows, but um, all the movie credits associated with them. 
And of course, if you have the movie credits, then you can get the full details in the movie. And then if you've got the full details in the movie, you could get a list of similar movies, et cetera, et cetera. So you could navigate around the place. Um, there's a trending endpoint that gives you, I haven't looked at it now, but it gives you uh, what's currently trending in the context of movies, what's currently trending in the context of people. There's a certification endpoint which tells you what are the different certification categories. And that's one thing that's included in the movie's detail as to what its certification is. If I go back to the discovery endpoint, which we have used a lot, you may or may not have noticed this is um, kind of a, a sample of a URL call, an excerpt anyway, to the discovery endpoint. But the discovery URL has a query string part to it, which is this part here. And you, you should know about query strings. It's a HTTP thing. A query string is a whole combination of key value pairs. And now in the case of TMDB, the query string nearly always has the API as part of the query string. But when you're using the discovery endpoint, the query string allows you to include lots of different options where the options are asking TMDB for movies with particular characteristics, like uh, what year it was released on, except, um, what is its certification, and loads of other ones. So what that allows you to do is to query TMDB for a list of movies with certain uh, characteristics or properties or options. So it's a kind of a search facility, really. Now, you can get the full list. If you click on this link here, then brings you to the TMDB documentation eventually. And once it loads up, really, you can, and I'm advising you to poke around and see the different types of endpoints. I've given you the ones that really are of interest to you on that previous slide, but you can look at them in a little bit more detail. So if I find the discovery one, sorry, which is down. There we go. So this is the one we've used, but if you scroll down a little bit, you can see here what the query string options are, and there are many of them, 28 plus. So it essentially allows us to query or to search the TMDB database for movies with certain uh, properties, if you like. So it would be nice, actually, if, if in our movies uh, app, we actually had a web form that allowed us to uh, select these particular properties. And then having filled out that form, maybe submit it, and then construct the query string that would be appropriate to send to the discovery endpoint. That's just one idea, but um, so what I would like you to do, I think, is to go to that website, go to that documentation page. First of all, just review these, like then go to that page and look at a little bit more detail uh, behind each of these endpoints. Now, of course, where all of this is going is in relation to the assignment. And I'm going to, I'm not going to 
uh, talk into this now because it's too important to do this late in the afternoon, but I'm going to uh, talk over this on Monday. As we know now, there's no new material being covered uh, next week. So on Monday's lecture, I will talk over this. In the meantime, you can have a look at it and I'll explain any points that may not be clear and also any questions that you might have relating to it.